Now, Oda definitely started with a banger because this chapter was godlike. Coming off of the one month break, I think this was very satisfying. And again, we know that this is the essentially the introduction to the final saga for One Piece. And man, it delivered on a lot of things. And it is honestly a great start to what could be one of the greatest sections of One Piece ever. Because the big players are finally coming out of the woodwork and actually finally taking action. Individuals like Shanks, Dragon, the Revolution revolutionaries, Blackbeard, everything is just culminating towards this end goal that we're heading towards and it's going to be chaotic as hell. Like literally, we have the recipe of what could be one of the greatest things ever. We're just waiting for Oda to deliver, honestly. But let's talk about One Piece chapter 1054. But before I keep going guys, I'd appreciate it if you dropped a like on this video, subscribe if you're new here, and hit the bell if you want to get notified for future content on this channel. Definitely helps me push out more content for you guys. Now, let's start from the beginning. Now, the chapter starts off with where we left off with Green Bull heading towards the flower capital. And here he encounters individuals that I did not expect. Here he encounters the scabbards, which is a very interesting choice, but I like where this is going. Interestingly enough, it seems like they were able to sense that he was coming to the capital. And so they chose to interfere him before he starts any chaos, which was a very good decision because based on what we know with the admirals and the animals they represent, Green Bull, him representing a bull isn't a good thing it seems like he's very rational in terms of his personality and someone that seems to attack first rather than go into conversation with people so it's good that he didn't actually get into the capital and start his business over there so they encountered him in the outskirts of Wano, essentially. Now, I did expect Green Bull to be a very hot-headed character, but he seems to be idolizing the Celestial Dragons a bit too much for my liking. Because here he talks about how the Celestial Dragons are gods and that Wano, who has no ties to the world government, has no chance or standing in the world just because it's not affiliated with the world government. So it should be a country that should get taken over and that humanity only got this far because of the system of hierarchy within society, right? So with Green Bull, it seems like he's clearly the opposite of Fuji Fujitora, and I think that's what Oda was going for here. Even though he was chilling with Fujitora during his intro, uh, his introduction, which was kind of weird. It seems like they have contrasting personalities and ideologies when it comes to how the world should operate, right? So again, even though I don't really necessarily like his personality, I do think that he makes the story a lot more interesting because we do need characters that are action-based and do enforce what they preach. And Green Bull seems to be that individual. Now here we also come to find out that his ability is actually a Logia, which I did speculate that it was either a Logia or a mythical Zoan. It had to be one of those two, and it turns out to be a Logia, which is very interesting because we've never seen a Logia of this extent, a Logia that is this solid in nature, right? It makes a lot of sense because plants are natural elements that exist naturally in the world, right? So it makes sense that he is a Logia, but it is a very interesting ability, and I think it's one that comes with a lot of versatility. It's not downright broken as the original trio admirals in terms terms of lethal abilities but it is something that i could see that could come in different forms right and i think versatility definitely plays a part in his power again oda always subverting expectations with these abilities him being a logia was probably a surprise to a lot of people but i think this makes a lot of sense now in terms of the battle itself him against the scabbards nothing really substantial went on here things only got heated when yamato came in because again we know that she's a very capable fighter and someone who can match a yonko in a 1v1 as she does displayed with Kaido. So it's no surprise that she can by herself keep Green Bull at a standstill. And we see in this chapter that she uses a Conqueror's Hockey attack to hit Green Bull on the head. And he makes a comment that her hockey is very powerful. We'd also see Momonosuke try to come in as well to stop Green Bull. And again, given that he's the Shogun, it makes a lot of sense for him to defend his people, right? And he definitely didn't want like the Straw Hats to deal with this situation, given what they've accomplished in Wano so far. And given the fact that they are are supposedly recovering as well having them have to deal with an admiral after the fact is a bit too much so the scabbards momonosuke and yamato put this upon themselves to deal with this situation and it's crazy when you think about it because wano just literally got liberated and then you have green bull coming in here storming in saying that he's gonna subjugate them yeah no chance that anyone's gonna allow that happen especially since wano just got liberated now i do wonder what exactly is going to happen in this encounter though because i don't see green bull losing 
losing. But at the same time, I don't see Green Bull going into the capital and causing as much chaos as possible, right? And even if it does, there's Luffy, there's Kid, there's all these top tier fighters in the in the capital, and it's going to be a lot for Green Bull to deal with. So again, this is one of those situations where I think Oda is going to subvert expectations once again, because I don't know how things are going to play out. There's going to be a twist somewhere down the road, because again, we do know that we need to get out of Wano and move on to the next arc, right? So something's going to happen in which the Straw Hats will get enough time to leave Wano. But at the same time, with someone as radical as Green Bull being there, it's hard to envision, you know, him not getting in your way. So this is going to be very hard to predict. So this is a very interesting chain of events. And we do also know that Momonosuke has something to prove as well, because he tells the other Scabbards and Yamato not to get involved. So I wonder what exactly is going on here. He might make some sort of deal here with Green Bull. And again, we know that Momonosuke does not want to open the borders to Wano yet. So again, that's something that we need to take into account as well. So there's so there's a lot of variables and it's hard to see how things are going to play out. Now, moving on to Shanks, probably the most interesting part of the chapter. And here we come to see that Shanks and his crew are very close to Wano. And they're essentially all reacting to the news of Luffy becoming an emperor. And again, since Luffy has become a great pirate, it makes a lot of sense for them to actually go meet Luffy. And so a lot of them were thinking that they should head into Wano and finally meet Luffy. Of course, you had Yasub saying that he wasn't ready to meet Usopp yet, but also interestingly, Shanks has no intentions of meeting Luffy at this point in time. And again, this is Oda subverting expectations again, again, which makes the story a lot more interesting because these curveballs definitely hit your heart. Now, there's probably a lot of reasons as to why Shanks does want to meet Luffy here, but one thing that he does mention is Bartolomeo. If you guys remember, Barto was essentially claiming Claiming one of Shanks's island as Luffy's territory. So in a sense, it makes sense as to why Shanks doesn't want to meet Luffy here because Luffy has essentially come to the point where he can rival Shanks, even though they're friendly in terms of knowing each other. What Barto did is Luffy sort of displaying his fangs towards Shanks in a very undirect way. So Shanks is not taking this as, oh, just because Luffy became a great pirate, it's going to be all buddy buddy now. If anything, it's made Luffy more of a threat to Shanks now because interestingly we do also find out that shanks is also interested in the one piece and that he feels like it's time to actually go find it so this is really really interesting a lot of people had shanks as the gatekeeper of one piece they had him as sort of the middleman to the one piece but but most people did not think that shanks was actually aiming for the one piece just like the others right because his role seemed to have been very different and he moved a lot differently from the other yonkos so a lot of people came up with that speculation but here it essentially confirms that shanks is still in the race for the one piece and he's definitely very serious about it so i like where this is going and i think this chapter also confirmed that shanks more than likely knew that the gomu gomu no mi was very special because we get to see a flashback here in which they attack the cp9 ship uh which we, we also get to see a younger um who's who and they think that the gomu gomu no mi is some sort of minor devil fruit that turns your body that makes you only rubber but it seems like again they knew that this devil fruit was special in nature and shanks does also see luffy's appearance in the bounty which probably confirms his assumption on luffy's devil fruit being special so it's obvious that he's privy to some of the knowledge of the void century the ancient kingdom and some of that stuff not maybe not the entire story because we know that he didn't go to rafto but he does know a lot of things that he discovered on his journey with roger but i will say that i am extremely excited for shanks being brought back into this into the story in a very active light so we'll see how things play out and finally we end off the chapter with a massive reveal in terms of the situation revolving around sabo and the reverie because that's something that's been teased for way too long and here we do get answers now here we get to see a conversation between a kainu and a new individual called black horse or kuro and here he's talking about how Sabo attacked the Holy Land and destroyed the symbol of the Celestial Dragons, which was essentially a declaration of war. And we do also see that Sabo has a new title in which they're calling him the Flame Emperor, which I find to be very interesting because when Luffy got a buff, Sabo seems to get a buff as well, right? Luffy is an emperor of the sea, Sabo is the emperor of flames. 
Now, this situation is obviously filled with a lot of misconception or misunderstandings, I should say. And you can tell because in the newspapers, they mentioned that Sabo was responsible for assassinating King Cobra, which more than likely is not true and was manipulated by the world government. Because again, it fits their agenda and it's very believable because we know that the revolutionaries whole goal is to topple the Celestial Dragon. And given that the Nefertari were descendants of the Celestial Dragon, even though there weren't one at this point in time, it gives more credence to people believing that Sabo actually killed Cobra, even though more than likely that wasn't the case and that he was most likely killed by the Gorosei and it does also mention that Vivi also disappeared as well. So they're using this incident to cover up everything that they did essentially. We know that Vivi was a target of Imusama and we know that Cobra was investigating too deep for his own good. So they're blaming everything that they committed on the revolutionaries. So it's working for them on one side of things but on the other side Sabo is also getting recognition on a whole new level to the point that he's regarded as a hero to the people where his influence is getting to the point that it could be greater than that of dragon because we also come to see that eight kingdoms essentially staged a coup while their kings were still returning home from the reverie so while the war government did manage to cover their asses on some things it also backfired on them as well so it would seem that this was a very successful mission for sabo and those guys because again not only did they manage to rescue kuma but they also made a name for themselves themselves and bolstered the revolutionary army to some extent so again this was an amazing start to the saga because we're seeing everything the build up and all of these things variable elements converging into one single place right and you can really tell that the end goal is in sight and again i do believe that the marines presence are going to be a lot more common moving forward at this point in the story because beforehand it was more so focused on pirates big mom and kaido big mom and kaido now i think with these major players at the end here i think the marines are going to come back into play here and that goes to what akainu states in this chapter in which he states that they will strike back and return fire on all fronts so i think we're going to see the marines take w's moving forward because for the most part in the new world they haven't really done anything at all but this was a great chapter and i cannot wait for more but that is pretty much it for this video guys i'd appreciate it if you drop the like on this video comment down below what you guys think hit the bell if you're gonna get notified for future content on this channel subscribe to the channel if you're new you can follow me on twitter at ferrospace but it is fair guys and i will see you folks later peace